Then we're going to get into images. Um, the idea of text formatting is sort of like this. If you consider that we can have a bunch of text on the page, but not all the text on the page means the same thing. All right. Um, We've already seen an example of that, right? We have headings versus just ordinary paragraphs. Now, those don't mean the same thing. You know, a, he a headline or a heading is just sort of like the main idea. And we treat it different visually by making it bigger and, you know, uh, compared to regular text. A regular paragraph is just a regular paragraph of text that you're going to read. Now there's some other cases where there will be text on our page that's a little different than the other text. And we need to be able to indicate that. So following the theme that we've been doing in this class, we indicate it via HTML tags. We indicate that the text means something a little bit different via our HTML tags and then the browser typically has some default look for those things. All right. If we want to change the default look of those things, we can do that via CSS. So let's go in and let's just make um, let's just make a, a basic HTML file. Yeah, I think it is too. There you go. Um, this should be covered the first week in every technology class. If something doesn't work, try turning it off and then turning it back on. All right. You know, it, it's funny. Um, there, there's actually a British show called The IT Crowd where they always joke about that. They're technical support people. That's how they answer the phone. Yeah, that, exactly. Uh, but. Uh, the funny part of it is, is it works a lot, right? So, I mean, in, in one respect, it's kind of like, well, you know, they're just blowing the, the call off. But in another respect, it's like, well, that works a lot. So, always try that. So, all I did was I turned the computer off, turn it back on, or I turned the switch to laptop, switch to console, and we're back in business. All right. Anyhow, back to text formatting. I'm going to put my doc type in. Uh, um... I'm going to put my HTML tag and an HTML tag. I think it's a good habit as soon as you put the tag in to put the ending tag in. You don't know how many pages I see without an and body tag or without an and uh, HTML tag because people assume that they're going to go back later and put them in and they don't, of course. Head is completely distinct from header, right? Yeah, that, that's unfortunate. The head is distinct from header, and all of the above are distinct from H1s, H2s, H3s. Um, the, the best way that I can think to describe it is head is information that is like about the page. It's not really part of the page proper. Um, the title, which is part of the head, appears up in the title bar. Well, we're going to typically put other stuff in the head section. It doesn't really necessarily relate to the, to, to the main part of the page, the body of the page. You know, we'll put our style there. We'll put our, um, when, when we go into JavaScript, we'll put our JavaScript there. So, uh, again. Um, if you were going to have a header, would, you lift it, would it be above the head or below the head? It's in the body. It's in the body. Because the header is something that actually displays on the page. Like, a, you know, think of a header would be like a banner on a page and would have maybe the company logo and maybe some words about the company or whatever. Um, and that would be on the body of the page. All right. Let's go in and. I don't know. Let's find Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. All right. 
to follow through on that thought, I will put a header section in here. And I'll put in here an H1. This will be my Abe Lincoln page. And for now, we're just going to have an H1 in here, but we could have other headers. We could, um, later on in, the, in the, the class today, we'll talk about images. Maybe we'll put an image of, of old Honest Abe up in here. Um, we don't really have a navigation at this point, so I'll leave that out for now at least. We might come back later and do navigation. But I'm going to then put in a series of articles. All right. And so this first one, we'll say, is his Gettysburg address. And then I'll write a paragraph of my own where I'll say, you know, one of Lincoln's uh, most famous speeches was given in Gettysburg, PA. He said, and I'm going to quote him, all right? And I'm going to quote him with a big section of a quote, not just a couple words, all right? When you have a big quote, um, the web terminology for that and, and the publishing terminology of that is a block quote. So in other words, I'm going to take this big chunk of text and I'll just, I'll grab this, let's say. And I will put it in a block quote tag. So in this case, Essentially, we're, we're telling the browser that this text means something a little different. Namely, this text isn't my words. This text is, I'm quoting. And I'm quoting, actually, a big chunk of text. Do you have word rep turned off? Probably. Well, I'll sit and think pleasant thoughts for a minute. I guess I could stop at any point. Let's go and save this as my Lincoln page. Go up to the desktop, all files, Lincoln.html. Now, one thing that they've They've talked about, uh, they talk about it in the text, I don't know if I've explicitly mentioned it in class or not, is to not use spaces in your file names. So typically it's best to just have no spaces. If, if you want to have a space, put an underscore, put a dash in there. Um, there's a long reason for that. Um, spaces on a URL can sometimes confuse a browser and blah, 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 and, and all that. So for, it's best not to, not to even go there. So don't put spaces in there. So we'll save it. And now we can look at this, our page. And I'll open it up. And we notice that that text is visually treated a little different. Right? It's visually treated a little different because it is in a block quote tag, which is going to indent it a little bit. All right? That's the default behavior for a block quote, is that there's a little bit of an indentation. Now, and what I'll be doing probably for the next several classes, well, probably for the rest of the term, is, is talk a little bit about like what else we could do styling-wise with this. All right? We don't like, you know, that's the browser's default. Remember, your page and the way your page looks is always a combination of 
the, the CSS code that you put in plus the browser's defaults for handling certain HTML tags. So by default, the browser's going to indent a block quote a bit. But we can do other things with it too, right? We can go in and if we wanted to, we could put our style tag here. and say block quotes that's a selector that says what on the page gets the style rule in this case it will be all the block quotes I want to have a background of pound sign 333333 what color is that? 333333. Three, 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 three. It's gray. Is it a dark gray or a light gray? It's pretty dark gray. In fact, let's change that because uh, I really want a light gray. So that would be a light gray. How do you know it's gray? Because the three pairs of hexadecimal digits are equal. So there is equal amounts of red, green, and blue. And that, that makes for a gray. How do I know that AAA is a light shade of gray where 333 three, three is a dark shade? Well, the higher the number, the, the more light there is. So FFFFFF is everything on full blast that will be the color white. All zeros will be uh, everything turned off, which is black. All right? And Somewhere in between is going to be somewhere in between. You know, the higher it is, the closer the gray is to white. The lower the numbers are, the closer it is to black. So, we'll go here and save this and we'll look again. Oops. And there's that shade of gray. Or we can view it in Chrome if we if would rather. And there's that shade of gray. If we want to make it lighter still, we could make the digits higher. Keeping in mind, again, that the digits are just like regular decimal digits from 0 through 9, but then we have an extra six digits, A, B, C, D, E, F, that correspond to the decimal numbers 10 through 15. So if I go and save that, then all right, that's a lighter gray. And that's kind of what I was shooting for. All right. Now there's more things, of course, we can do to this that's too. We could change the font size of it to, to emphasize it or to make it stand out. At the very least, make it look different than the rest of the text. This is different text than the rest of the stuff. This isn't my words. This is, I'm quoting someone else. A, a fundamental rule of design is like things should look alike, different things should look different. Right? So if there's something different about this text, it makes sense for us to make it look different. In that way, we're very subtly educating our users about how we've laid out our page and what the stuff means. So if I do this, if every time I have a quote, I use a block quote tag and I style it in a consistent way, the user will see this and will immediately know that I'm quoting someone. They won't even have to think about it. Just like if I style my navigation links a certain way, uh, if I style, um, you know, uh, additional information about a topic that's maybe like uh, not the main piece of information, but like a related information, you're gradually, very subtly, teaching your users how your page is laid out and what the stuff on the page means. All right. So if I wanted to make it bigger, I could do that by changing the font size. Now there's a couple of different ways I can change a font size. The one I prefer to do is font-size and you can do give the size in M's. What's an M? An M relates to the amount of emphasis there is. So one M is normal size. Normal amount of emphasis. One is considered like the baseline. So 1.3M would be 30% bigger than normal. All right, so it would be 
the normal size. So you don't have to give it a type size. You don't give it a specific font size, right. And, and again, that becomes important when uh, you're talking about people have different browser settings or any number of different things. Absolutely right. So I'll go and say, yes. Well, no, in fact, you don't want to do that because the whole idea of M is I could go to my browser and I can, I can, all right, there it is, it's a little bigger. I can go and I can zoom it. So if I had a specific font size in mind, I'm not going to achieve that anyhow, all right. One thing and this is almost going to sound philosophical, but one thing about web design, in some respects, you kind of have to let some things go about it looking like exactly the way you, you intend it. Because there's so many things that you just don't have control over. You don't have control over the fact of how big this screen is or what they set their screen resolution uh, to. You don't have control over what browser they use. You don't have control uh, whether they're using a, a computer or a mobile device. They may be viewing this on a tiny little phone, all right? Because of that, your job is to make the page look good, um, being usable, sort of the, what they call the pixel perfect design where you get a design that looks perfect and identical on every single platform. Kind of you have to let go of that. All right. So, block quote is one of the extra tags. Um, another tag is if I want to emphasize something because it's important. So if I wanted to emphasize the words most famous, let's say, for whatever reason. I could put it in an M tag. And in a way, it's just sort of a coincidence that the M here is the same M as that. They both mean emphasis, but they get treated a little bit differently. What's the difference between that and the B? The difference between that and the B is emphasis is a syntactical um, tag. In other words, it says why you're making it bold, as opposed to something being bold. Specifically, the M tag is actually more closely related to the I tag, the italics tag, because by default it's going to put the, this text in italics. So we go and pull this up and we'll see that the words most famous are in italics. That's the default behavior for M. Now we could choose to emphasize it some other way if we wanted to, but that's what the browser does by default. And remember, and I'll say this a million times this semester, the way your page looks is a combination of what the browser does by default for certain tags along with what you put in your own CSS code. The other thing that we can do is we can strongly emphasize something. So I can go in here and if I wanted to strongly emphasize the word Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, I could go in and put a strong tag around it. And by default, the strong tag gets bolded. Now, as you can see here, it's not good for us to put other people's words on a page without telling where we got it from. So, Oftentimes what you want to do is you want to cite your sources.
actually, that's not what I was looking at. There's a site attribute where you can specify the um, URL where we found it from. So for example, We got it from this page. I could put in my HTML code on this block quote a site attribute. And put the URL that it's from. Interestingly enough, visually that doesn't do anything, but it is embedded in the code, um, the source of it. Now the one thing that's confusing is in addition to the site attribute on a block quote, there's actually a site tag, which we were looking at a second ago. And the site tag actually relates to the title of a work. So if I was going to say, it was given in Gettysburg, It is called his Gettysburg Address. Gettysburg Address is the title of the speech. So we would put that in a site tag. And again, the browser takes and does something for defaults, but we can go and, and change this. The textbook contains a bunch of other stuff. There is, uh, there is markup to indicate uh, time. So if you're indicating the time of something, you know, the date and time, you, there, there's, there's special markup where you can put that in. There is uh, for definitions. There's abbreviations, and there's sub and superscript. So for example, if you were doing a, a chemical formula with H2O, and you wanted the two to be lower, you'd put that under in a, in a um, SUB tag to indicate subscript. So it would be down below. Whereas if you're doing a math, um, the Pythagorean theorem, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, you'd put the two in a superscript tag, an SUP tag, and that would make it above the line. I told you this topic was going to be boring, all right? So a lot of this stuff you can get from the text. The whole idea is the same. Essentially, you're marking up text to say, hey, this text is a little different for whatever reason. Interesting one is there's an insert and a delete uh, tag. That's useful if you, were, if you wanted to show that something has changed on your page. Um, you can use a delete tag. That way, people can see the text that used to be there. I know sometimes organizations do that with um, their policy and procedures. Like if they, ch you know, if they change the policy from, you know, you get two weeks vacation after a year to you get two weeks vacation after 18 months, they can show a strike through on the one year and they can show that 18 months were, uh, were uh, changed uh, from one year. All right. Read all that in the book and, and use it uh, where it's necessary. All right. Let's talk about images now, all right? With images, all right, images are a different tag. And we're going to start off with the basic assumption that the image that we have is in the same folder as our HTML page. So that's going to be our, our assumption starting off. Later on, we'll, we'll make it more flexible. But we're going to start off assuming that the image is in the same folder where our page is. <clears throat> when you turn in an assignment that contains an image, you should turn in everything. You, should, you need to turn in all the files. So if you have three images plus an HTML page, you need to turn in 
the HTML page and the three image files. Generally speaking, that's why it's best to put everything in a folder and then when you're ready to turn it in, you just zip up that folder and upload that. All right. So, um, images again are, are a big part of the web. Um, the, the cliche that people say is a, a picture's worth a thousand words. In web development, that takes a different meaning because a picture oftentimes takes up as much bandwidth as at least a thousand words and maybe even more than that. So you do have to be very careful uh, that the pictures that you add to your page add something to the page. You don't want to just put a lot of images on the page that really don't add any value to the page. Internet connections are faster than they've ever been and, and there's, there's, people can download things very quickly, but there are some people that work on slower connections and mobile devices on occasion have slower connections. So bandwidth, how long it takes to download a page is always going to be an issue. So therefore, you don't want to put stuff on the page that doesn't really add to the page. All right. That being said, you certainly can add something to the page by putting uh, an image in. You can make the page more visually appealing. All right. You can also provide more information all right, uh, than you would otherwise. Um, you know, uh, in my multimedia class, which, which meets uh, typically um, in spring semester, um, and it starts in January, and, and at that time in January, it's, it's Martin Luther King Day usually, right around the time when, when the classes start. And I always talk about his famous speech that he gave in Washington. All right. Now, it's one thing to put the words of the speech up there, and you can get some information from that, and it's very meaningful, but it's something else to actually see a photograph and to see how many people were assembled there. That gives you a sense of the scope of the event more than simply reading that there were X number thousand of people there. Right? That's much more, uh, has a much more impact, has a much bigger impact. All right? Um, today on 9-11. The text would mean one thing, but if you actually had images, that would increase the impact that your page had and the emotional uh, impact that your page had. So images are critical in getting um, your message across. So it's important to use them, but it's important to use them judiciously. That is, don't take the all-you-can-eat approach to web design where Gee, if one image is great, then 15 images must be excellent. All right? It doesn't work that way. You, know, you, you should pick and choose um, the things that are going to um, help your uh, message. So let's go find a picture of Abraham Lincoln. Fortunately, all those pictures of Abraham Lincoln are going to be old enough where they are no longer copyrighted. Right? So... They're, they're assumed to be, you know, I, I would say uh, every picture of Abraham Lincoln is in the public domain. So I don't need to worry about copyright on this particular one. If you are going to use an image that is more current than, than that, you do need to be concerned about copyright. And there is a handout on Angel that talks about like what you can use and what you can't use. Uh, in essence, you can take things from websites and use them for educational purposes in creating a website, but you have to give credit. So I'm going to continue that spirit and I'm going to, I'm going to put credit, I'm going to give credit um, for this image even though I don't strictly speaking need to. All right. So let's look for a photo of Lincoln. Which one do we like? Let's pick this one. That's a mammoth picture. We'll save it. And I'm going to save it on the desktop. And I'm going to call it Lincoln. And this is from Abraham Lincoln's Wikipedia page. All 
All right. So here's our image. This is where it's critical to have your file extensions turned on because images can have any number of different file extensions. There's different file types. And different file types are well suited for different kinds of images. For example, there are GIF images, which are typically like line drawings, which are drawings, or a limited number of colors. There are JPEG images. It's a very popular format. There's also PNG images. Now, unless you happen to notice real quick, it was on the screen, it's not apparent what kind of image that is. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure I've gone into my search op folder and search options and I turn off hide extensions for known file types. Now this is different. You find this switch in a different place on every version of Windows. So if you're using Windows 8, you're going to find it somewhere else. If, if you're using um, XP, you'll find it somewhere else. But again, again it, the, the, the text, the, 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 the caption is the same. Hide extensions for known file types. And I'm going to uncheck that. And then when I click OK, now when I look at the image, I see that it's actually, this is a PNG file. All right. So, and that's important because to, to put that image on my page, I need to know precisely what it's called. All right. So, let's go in and let's put this image on the page. So, I'm going to put it in the header section, because that might be a nice thing to have up in the header. Images are accomplished via the image tag. All right. But just like with the link tag, simply saying I have an image isn't enough. Right? Just like saying I have a link isn't enough. Well, link to what? Well, that's where we put in the href attribute. We specify, this is what I want to link to. All right? Same idea here. I could have hundreds of pages on my website. Which one of them do I want to use? Well, I have to put in the src attribute. And the src attribute says the name of the image that I want to include. The file name of the image. And it has to include the extension. So in this case, our image is called Lincoln.jpg. <laughs> wow, you people are more awake than me this morning. And I misspelled Lincoln. Jeez. Wow. One of these days I'm going to be an experienced enough a teacher to claim that I did that on purpose to see if you'll pay attention. I had, a, I had an old nun in fourth grade and she, she claimed that she fell asleep at her desk while we were working on our work to test to see who was going to behave even when they're not being watched. But, you know, even then I knew that she was just making that up, you know. I, 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 guess, I guess, you know, I was a skeptical fourth grader. All right. There's one other attribute that needs to be on every image, and that is an alt attribute. The alt attribute has a little explanation of what the image is. Now, what is this used for? This is used in a couple instances. Number one, it's used by people that are accessing the web that are visually impaired and are using a piece of software called a screen reader that actually narrates the page to them. All right? So there's software that you pull up a web page, if you're blind, it will read the page to you. It will read the words that are on the, on the, on the, on the page. And that's great. And it allows people that are blind to be able to access the web. And it'll read the links to them. It'll say you have a link here, and you have a link here, and all that. Well, what's it going to do for an image? You know, the software isn't so sophisticated where it could describe the image, right? So therefore, you put in an explanation what the image is. So something relatively short is fine. And at least there, the person that's accessing the screen 
that's visually impaired gets a sense of what's there. All right? It's not as good as seeing the image, obviously, but it's the best that we can do. All right? Now, there's really nothing between the start and end of an image tag. Strictly speaking, you don't even really need an end image tag. But I almost always put it in anyhow just because, um, you know, it, it, it seems like it's good to be consistent and everywhere you have a start tag, you have an ending tag. There's a little shortcut that you can do, whereas you can do this, whoops, and that indicates that this is a start tag and ending tag all rolled into one. So that's called an empty tag. And that indicates, hey, this is a start and end tag all rolled into one. It's this owned and end tag. So usually that's the syntax that I do. So for the image tag, you really have three choices. You could forget the end tag, which uh, sort of bothers the obsessive part of me to, to skip and leave off a, an end tag. You could put the end tag immediately following the start tag, like you do with other tags, which seems kind of pointless to me. Or you can do this, which is, is the preferred way for me. This way it has an end tag, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't seem goofy. So now let's look at this. And you probably know already what this is going to look like, right, if you were paying attention. That's a big old picture, all right? That might be too big for our purposes, right? Maybe not. Maybe we want it to look like this, all right? If we did, I would suggest that we have a link to link down to the Gettysburg Address, all right? But let's say we decide, we look at this and we say, you know, that image is just too big, all right? Let's go and resize it, all right? There's actually a couple ways to resize it, and I'm going to tell you the way that, that I would suggest doing it. I can resize it via HTML or CSS, but I'm not going to do that. Why do you think I'm not going to resize it via HTML or CSS? If, well, right, if I don't do it right, it can distort it. In other words, if, you know, if I wanted to make it in half, but I divided the height by three and the uh, width by two, it would be like either stretched out, it would either be wider or taller than it should be. So you do have to be careful, no matter how you resize, that you keep what's called the aspect ratio, the ratio between the height and width. Keep that correct. So that's, that's one potential problem. Yes? Yeah. If I make this page, if, if I make this file small, the browser still has to download the full image. So therefore, let's see how big this image is. This image is one megabyte, which is, you know, pretty big for an image, you know. So if I were to uh, resize it via CSS or HTML, it still has to download that full one megabyte. And then the browser will shrink it into the size that I want it to be. I would rather give, my, give the folks downloading this a little bit of time savings. If I'm going to make the picture small anyhow, I would rather go in and use a, some sort of photo editor to make it smaller. All right? Now, a couple things with photo editors. And this isn't a class in photo editing, but I think everyone that does web development should at least know some very basic things about photo editing, at least in terms of like resizing images. And that is you should always work off of a copy. Don't work on your original. All right? Um, that's probably less important when you're taking an image from somewhere else and using it because, you know, they have the original. But you can never make a pi picture bigger. If you make a picture bigger, you lose quality. All right? You can make a picture smaller, but you can't make it bigger. Because when you make it bigger, you're trying to put extra stuff in the image that isn't there. You've lost those pixels. So if I make a picture small, then make it big, those pixels that provided the additional detail are gone. 
and the photo editor has to guess and it's not going to do a good job guessing. All right. So therefore, to shrink an image is okay because it can go and it can figure out how to make an image smaller. But expanding an image, it's easier to take away information, I guess, than to add information. So I'm going to copy my image here. So I now have a copy of it. So if I really butcher this and I don't do a good job, if I make it too small and I say, hey, I want it to be a little bigger than that, I'll go back and, and repeat the process with the original. So I'm going to go and open this uh, using... Well, we have a lot of choices. I'm going to use good old-fashioned paint, which is available on just about every um, Windows machine. And I'm going to go into resize. Now, I can resize either by pixels or by percentages. All right. I would prefer to do it by percentages because then I know. Uh, or then I don't have to do any math, right? So if I did by pixels, this is 892 by 1,115. Let's say I wanted to make this one quarter of the size, half the height and half the width. What's half of 892? Too much thinking, all right? <laughs> but if I say, hey, I want 50% of this, and 50% of that, then I'm in business. All right. And as I said before, you want to be careful not to, well, in fact, it's not even going to let me change the one independent of the other, which is actually good. All right. Um, because um, then you, you won't run the case of stretching it out or, or whatever. Um, depending on the photo editor, some photo editors allow you to do that. That will too. Oh, I, I totally missed that. I just wanted to see if we were paying attention. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. So I'll go in and I'll make this 50%. And 50 per, uh, if I make the height end with 50%, I'm actually making the, 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 the image about the quarter of the size that it was before, right? because I'm making the height half and the width half, so I'm making it in half by two dimensions. So that's actually a quarter of the size. So I go and do that. Okay. I can look at that. Is that big enough? Nah, yeah, that's fine. Um, let's go in and let's have to actually make it smaller still. Let's make it 10%. Uh, it's a little too small. This is like the three bears, right? Let's make it 25% by 25%. Ah, just right. All right. Then I'll go and save it. And when we go and view this, yeah, that looks about right. It, it doesn't matter as long as they have a copy of it. I mean, it's just, you know, it doesn't really matter if the original is called copy and the copy. It's, as long as I have a copy that I can go and say, oh, wait, that isn't the right size. Let me go back to the original. Okay. As long as I have the original to, to, to go back to. If we look at this now... This is 107 KB from about a meg. So this got reduced by approximately one-tenth the size. So we, we did, a, we did a, a good job as far as that goes as well.
questions? And what? Well, the scroll bars will, will happen automatically if the page content exceeds. So in other words, I didn't have to do anything in particular to get that scroll bar. All right. Simply because there is more content here than, than is available on the screen, the scroll bar appears. Now there are ways to put scroll bars on sections of a page. All right, and, and we'll, we'll review that later on when we do some more CSS stuff. Other questions? Underline, underline certain text. Repeat that please. How to underline certain text. How, how to underline certain text. All right. Um, well, that's a good question. That is actually the text decoration property. So let's look at this page. Isn't there an HTML tag for underline? You know, if this is a Western, <laughs> like let's say this was a Western movie and we were in a saloon and there was people rustling and all that. When you said that, everything would stop. And they'd play very dramatic music. And I'd be done. No. There is an HTML tag to do that. But you know what? We will never use it. Why will we never use it? Because that's an aspect of appearance. And as such, it does not belong in HTML. There's a tag there that's kind of a leftover from when HTML was the only game in town. But we're not going to use it because we can do a better job via CSS. So why would we underline something? Well, we might underline something because we might underline, for example, the title of the speech. All right. So the title, if you remember, the speech is in the site tag. So I could do site text decoration underline. Now, we go and save this and view it. There we see it gets underlined. Now, a couple things to, to say here. Remember, why would you want to underline something? You'd want to underline something because it's somehow different than the surrounding text. Alright, so maybe you want to underline something because it's important. That would be the M or the strong. Maybe you want to underline something because it's a title. Maybe you want to underline something because it's a, it's a block quote even. Alright, the point is, is if you want to underline something, you want to underline it for a reason. And that reason is going to be covered by probably one of those text formatting tags, and then you put the CSS rule for that. Now, one second. The one thing I would urge you to be careful about is, on the web there is a convention that underlying things mean links. All right. So, you must be very careful not to mislead people into thinking that that's a link. Because right? otherwise it will drive you crazy. Let me show you my absolute least favorite thing on the web. Northeast Ohio Jazz Calendar. Ooh, I want to see what's coming up. Click more below for a complete. Okay, I'm going to click that more link. <laughs> Nothing's happening. Because that really isn't a link. This is a link. <laughs> that is the worst thing I've ever seen done on the web. This is, this is an outrage, uh, you know. And the amazing thing is I visit this page, I don't know, once a month maybe. 
and still I click on the wrong link. Even though I know that that's not the right thing. Because just the habit that you have is so entrenched that you go and do that. So this is really a dramatic case. But I guess what I would say, what I would say is be sure that your user doesn't get confused when they see something underlined. They also make it blue. They also made it blue, yeah. <laughs> they're, re they're really trying to mess with me. So yeah, that might be one way to do that. If you really wanted to have the word more underlined there, don't make it look exactly like a link. You know, I would say, I would say first of all, you don't even need that phrase in there. You know, they just that. Who knows? <laughs> the end result is that it's really confusing and really bad. Now, WRUW is a great college radio station, by the way. So don't think that this is my opinion of the entire organization. This is my opinion of this one piece of their web page. All right. Did you have a question a second ago? Yeah, I did. Oh, yeah. What if you just wanted to bold or emphasize uh, one or underline one word in a big paragraph? Is it still wrong to use the old-fashioned uh, HTML tag for that? Yes. Because again, why do you want to underline it? Maybe because it's more important, in which case you could use the emphasize uh, tag, the EM tag or the strong tag. Let's say... CSS? No, the EM tag is not CSS, but the EM tag indicates that this is something that's emphasized and we're going to represent this emphasized via underline. Now, if there really is truly something that we want underlined for no real good reason, all right, it's not emphasized, it's just that we like underlines, then you could use a CSS ID or a CSS class to point to just that one word. All right? We'll talk about that later on. But yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much a purist as far as this goes. If it's appearance, it's in CSS. Because there's the ways to do things in CSS almost, you know, are, are always going to be conceptually superior than doing it at HTML. Um, because, you know, if you really look at what you're doing and why you're doing it, um, the CSS explanation for it, the CSS method typically makes a lot more sense. But yeah, even if there was just literally an arbitrary word that you want to underline, that for no special reason, but it just needs underlined, then you could use a class or an ID and put like a span around it, and then you could underline it that way. But most of the time you want to underline something for a reason. Right? There, there's something special about it that you want to underline it, in which case many of the text formatting commands would apply there. Other questions? All right, we'll see you up in LAMB.